I didn't know I was going to be preaching again before Christmas. I, last time I preached, my sermon had a bit of a Christmas theme, and I did it then because I thought that would probably be my last chance to preach before Christmas, and so I used it. And then Brother Melvin called me um, last week and asked me if I would take this, and I said yes, but the only sermon I had in the works is the one that you're getting, and it's not a Christmas sermon, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's what the Lord gave me. There's going to be a lot of scripture in it today. So if you've got a Bible, that will be something you'll be using here. Before we get started, let's have another word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us your word. It is truth. It is our sword. It's that thing that connects us to you. Because it's by that thing that we know you, first and foremost. Dear Lord, as we read and study today, we pray for the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the gift of his guidance in the word, to help us rightly divide this word of truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Liars lie. That's what liars do. Have you ever known somebody who is a liar? There are a few of them around, so I'm guessing most of you have had to deal with one. There are some people, there, there's the old saying, they'll tell a lie when the truth would do them good. They just seem to like to lie. Other people are more strategic about their lying. And if you know somebody, if you have a relationship in your life where somebody you know is willing to lie when it serves their purposes, then you understand that a liar does something to their words. They put an asterisk next to everything they say. And the asterisk says at the bottom of the page, it says, if it's true. What do you know when a liar tells you something? You only know that they told you something. You don't know if it's true or not. And this is not the way we like to operate. Does it matter why a liar tells a lie? Does it matter if you can figure out what their objective is? It's still a lie. Lies are lies. God does not lie. Satan does lie. We're pretty clear on all of that. This morning we're dealing with the subject of deception. And this is not a pleasant sermon for me to preach. At least parts of it are not. There, there are parts that I think you'll agree with me are, are beautiful and wonderful. And as we look at the scriptures, you'll, you won't have any trouble distinguishing which ones those are. Um, just recently, I saw something come up on the internet about a new book that's come out by a doctor, I think it was, about near-death experiences. And it sounded like it was supposed to be groundbreaking stuff. But then within the week, I was talking on the phone to a friend of mine who is not Seventh-day Adventist, but spends a lot of time listening to 3ABN radio. And so he asked me these questions when we talk on the phone, sort of, you know, trying to understand, you know, maybe where we're coming from. He'll detect some things as he's listening. And he says, okay, I know you guys, uh, you pretty much, you know, you believe that dead people are dead and that nobody goes to heaven until the resurrection. He said, but somebody was showing me a book and it was about this little boy. And I knew what book it was because somebody about six, seven years ago had shared that book with me. And I actually tracked it down on the internet and bought a used copy so I could read it again because the person who shared it with me is no longer living and I didn't, didn't have access to the book. So I bought it and read it again. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this book. It's got a picture of a really cute little boy on the cover. And his name is Colton. And the book is called Heaven is for Real, a little boy's astounding story of his trip to heaven and back. I remember reading the story, and as I was reading it, I was 
thinking, well, where do I, what do I do with this? How do I talk to somebody about what this book is saying? But as the story went on, it sort of unfolds. It's told in a way that you start, it's like walking out into the lake, and you, the further you walk, the deeper it gets, and all of a sudden you're in a deep place. It's not a jumping in thing, it's a walking in slowly, and all of a sudden you're out there in it thing. And uh, I can't read from you anything in this book, I don't think, uh, because it says here, all rights reserved, no portion of this book may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, scanning, or other, except for brief quotations in critical reviews or articles without the prior written con permission of the publisher. So I'm not going to read you anything out of the book, but I will tell you a little bit about what it's about. This boy, uh, his parents... Uh, were pastoring a Wesleyan church. Good people, good Midwestern, nice people. I grew up with people like that, wonderful people. He had to have this little boy, four years old, had to have an emergency app appendectomy. And they put him under. And they didn't know that they had apparently almost or possibly lost him during the surgery. There was nothing that registered that he had stopped breathing or his heart had stopped. And yet, it turned out after a while, after he'd survived the operation, he started telling his dad little things. Now, this is a four-year-old boy, and he's sharing things that made that his parents start to wonder what he had experienced. And he very matter-of-factly said that he, he said, I was dead for three minutes. And I went to heaven. And the more he told, the more the three minutes sounded like a lot more than three minutes. Now, I don't know how these things can happen. I'm not even, it's not my business to try to figure out how these things happen. So I'm, I'm just telling you that. But he kept relating things that he had seen to his father. And he, his father was amazed because they were biblical things. He saw Jesus and Jesus was dressed in white and he had this gold thing around his waist. And he was seeing things that a four-year-old boy wouldn't understand what, that they're in the Bible. And as it went along, um, his father and mother started trying to figure out, you know, how do we get information out of him without asking leading questions. We don't want to be putting thoughts into his mind so he regurgitates back to us what he thinks we want to hear. We just want him to tell us what he saw. And every once in a while, he'd, he'd just matter-of-factly state something else. And it got to a point one day where he, he mentioned someone named Pop, who was his great-grandfather, his dad's grandfather, who had, had actually raised this boy's father, done a lot of, uh, in his formative years, his, his actual father had had, uh, was bipolar, severely bipolar, and had to be institutionalized, and when all that was going on, they sent the, the boy, which was Colton's father at the time, he was a boy, they sent him to live with his grandparents, and so Pop was his grandfather, and Pop was a very influential figure in his young life. They went hunting and fishing together and they had a very close relationship and Pop died at the age of 61 in a car accident. So he died decades before Colton was born. And Colton says that when I was in heaven I met Pop. He's your grandfather, right? And he starts telling him things, you know. You like to go fishing with him and you did this with him and you did that with him and he said he told me that Jesus had asked you to preach, and you said yes, and it made Jesus very happy. And the father's like, I never talked about this with my son. He's only four years old. He didn't know all of this. So it's getting more and more out there, you know. It's getting, the water's getting deeper. So then one day he's, he says, you know, I heard him describe other things in heaven with a lot of detail, and he said he hadn't really described Pop, and I'm wondering if he actually saw Pop. So I showed him, he said, the last picture I had of Pop was a prized possession of mine, and I kept it in my desk drawer. He's 61 years old, gray hair, glasses. He showed his son that, and he said, Dad, nobody in heaven is old, and nobody wears glasses. And so it's like he didn't even recognize the guy in the picture. So this bothered his father because he still wants to have that positive proof that he really saw his 
grandfather in heaven. So he gets an idea. Okay, nobody's old in heaven. I need a young picture of my grandfather. So he calls up grandmother, who's still alive, in another state, and she says, I'll find you a picture. He says, well, don't mail it. It's too valuable. Just take a photocopy and send it to me. So she does this. A couple of weeks go by, and she gets this picture, and it's a family picture. There's a pop and his wife, grandmother, who's still alive, and the two children. Uh, so he shows this picture to Colton. Colton says, wow, where did you get a picture of Pop? So this is, this is all wonderful. If you're most, most churches down the street, I could be talking about this, and they'd all be just smiling, and this would be great, right? You're not, not many of you smiling out there, are you? No. No. This is kind of a problem, as we're going to see from the Word of God. And I want to be clear that these are not evil people. These are deceived people. And it's unfortunate that the, the boy's father is a pastor and knows enough about the Bible to know um, the, the right things that were right in this, whatever you want to call it, delusion, deception, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, vision. Whatever this was that happened. It's, uh, when you, if you're going to be a good liar, do you just tell whoppers? Or do you have a lot of truth mixed in with your story to get your point across that you want to get across? There's a, a scripture at the beginning of this book. I think I'm safe to read it because it's the word of God. It says, the introduction of the book says, quote, this is a quote from Jesus of Nazareth. I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I have some other scriptures that I think would go well with this story. But the first thing I want to say is, uh, when does a human body go to heaven? At the resurrection, right? It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to be tricky here this morning. We know that the human body is resurrected and we get a glorified body. So if you're in heaven without a body, but what you have looks like a body to where people recognize it as a body and it functions as a body, what is it? Why would you need to be resurrected? Why would you need to come back down here and get back in your body and be resurrected if you have that? That's working. Right? Well, let's open our Bibles this morning. Acts chapter 2. Please realize there are a lot more scriptures that I could go to, but we are not wanting to stay that late here this morning, so we'll, uh, we'll look at a few things. Just know there are other scriptures that could be referenced as well. I chose this one for a couple of reasons to start with. Acts chapter 2, you might recognize that's Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And I point that out because no Christian who believes in the Bible as the infallible word of God would argue that the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost were from the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 22, Jesus, Peter is preaching, and he's preaching to them about Jesus. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Now, he starts to mention David. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, and I may, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made 
known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of, your joy, full of joy in your presence. So he's quoting David in the book of Psalms, and he's talking about how David knows that his, his soul, his flesh, will rest in hope because his soul will not stay in Hades, which is the grave. And he says, your holy one will not see corruption. Jesus wasn't in the grave long enough to see corruption. So it's a prophecy. You have made known to me the joys, the ways of life. Verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak, speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit in his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor his flesh, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. What's, Dave, uh, what's Peter's point? He's making the point that as much as they revered David, Jesus was greater. Because David prophesied of Jesus. And Jesus was resurrected to heaven. There's a couple things I want to point out that are so obvious that I had never actually noticed them before. I thought this was kind of a weak passage for proving the state of the dead thing. It's not. Peter's making a point about David's grave is still with us. And if you understand who he's speaking to and the time frame that he's speaking to, let me, let me just get you to turn to Matthew. Keep a finger here. We're coming back here, but turn to Matthew 27. While you're turning to Matthew 27, I'm going to mention two things that would be familiar to these people. Number one, the obvious. Jesus has just risen from the dead, and a lot of those people knew it. Some of them had seen Jesus after he was resurrected. They all knew that his tomb had a big stone in front of it that was rolled away, and his tomb was empty. That's obvious. They also, a lot of them, knew about the resurrection of Lazarus. Do you remember when Jesus, you can read it in John 11, when Jesus raised Lazarus, he said, the first thing he said when he arrived there, he told them, roll the stone away. Okay, this is real basic, right? It's like, what's your point? Let's look at another one. This is Matthew 27, and we want verses, starting at verse 50. Matthew 27, 50. This is Jesus' last moments of life on, on the cross. J Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit, spirit, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were what? Opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Okay, these are also things that were well known to the people of Jerusalem from not very long ago. What happens when somebody's resurrected? The grave is opened. They knew this. They didn't want to know this. Seriously, they didn't want to know this because the cornerstone of all this is that Jesus was resurrected. They didn't want to believe that. But how could they not? How could they deny that they'd seen people that they knew had died coming out of their graves and walking around? And it says that many people saw them. So when Peter makes the point that David's grave is still with us and it's nicely sealed up, that's a big deal. He is proving that Jesus is superior to David. And they don't want to believe that. But it's true. So here we're finding out how God does things when he brings people back to life. He opens their grave so everybody can see the grave is empty and the person has come out with a body. The 
Bible knows nothing about disembodied spirits going to heaven at death. You have to read that into any passage you're reading. The Bible doesn't say that. If you're looking for that nice key text that would show that dead people without bodies in spirit form go back to heaven at death, at the moment of death, you won't find it. It's not in the Bible. Now, if you still have your finger in Acts chapter 2, let's make it even more plain. Verse 34, Peter tells them, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says of himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Peter says, point blank, David is not in heaven. He never ascended to heaven. His tomb is still with us. He hasn't resurrected. But Pop has. Do you see my point? Why is this kid's great-grandfather running around in heaven telling about things that are going on on earth when David's not in heaven? When the Bible doesn't teach that dead people go straight to heaven. This is a delusion. And it's heartbreaking because this isn't a delusion given to somebody who's evil. This is given to somebody who loves the Lord. Does that ever happen? Sure it does. It happens to people who love Jesus. It happened to Peter, remember? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but, but the Spirit of God has revealed it to you. A minute, two minutes later, get thee behind me, Satan. Same Peter, but now he's deceived. He's deluded. And Jesus rebukes him. So what my point is, is that if, if you've been deceived by Satan, it doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a deceived person. And I want to be clear about that. Because these are nice people. And this picture, this little boy, there's more pictures inside. He's a sweet looking boy. I mean, you'd have to be a pretty callous person not to just look at him and, and love him. Would the devil really be that low down? Amen. Yes, he would. Some of you are fami familiar with the Ministry of Amazing Facts. This is an old pamphlet. I don't know how long I've had it. I think it probably co goes back to the Joe Cruz era. Are the dead really dead? Do they still print this one? I don't know. Mine's getting, yeah, mine's getting kind of yellowed here. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but I want to read a couple things. This is num question number seven in the, in the pamphlet. How much does one know or comprehend after death? Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So in other words, if somebody were alive in heaven, they wouldn't be. But if they were, would they have anything to do with what's going on down here? It says no. Verse 10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. So when you're in the grave, you're what? You're dead. You're asleep, as Jesus said. Number eight, but can't the dead communicate with the living? And aren't they aware of what the living are doing? This is from Job 14, verses 12 and 21. So a man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. And then verse 21 says, His sons come to honor, and he knoweth it not. And they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not of them. Answer, no, the dead cannot contact the living, nor do they know what the living are doing. They are dead. Their thoughts have perished, as it says in Psalm 146, verse 4. If you would, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. While you do that, I'm going to read you a passage of Scripture. This is 
Ephesians 6, 11 through 13 in the NIV. This is Paul writing. Remember, you're looking for 2 Thessalonians 2. This is Paul. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. In other words, when you've done everything you can, you're still standing. Matthew 24, verse 24, for false, these are the words of Jesus, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. That's the title of my sermon, If It Were Possible. What did Job say? He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and will stand in the, at the latter day upon the earth and though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh will I see God. Not without my flesh, not in my spirit, but in my flesh I will see God. That day will come for all of us who believe in and know Jesus. We will see him face to face, which means that we'll both have real faces. Here in the Second Thessalonians 2, we want verse 7. We'll start there. This is Paul's warning to us. He's, he's writing to the Thessalonians. He's talking about the end times. And he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, that's with a capital H because it's the Holy Spirit, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of the way. That doesn't sound good. That sounds like a very terrible time to be alive, doesn't it? And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because, now we're going to get to the heart of it. Jesus said, if it were possible... Even the very elect would be deceived. Why is it not possible? Because they have special protection from God, from His Holy Spirit. But what is it that makes them different? Right here. Talking about the unrighteous here, it says, we're in verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Does God send delusion? God allows delusion. That's what he's talking about. The delusion is not from God. He allows Satan to perpetrate delusion. Are we seeing it? It's happening already. Strong delusion that they might believe a lie. That they should believe a lie. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the scriptures that safeguard us. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm kind of going back and forth between the, the beautiful parts and the scary parts. I did that on purpose. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but 1 Corinthians 15. Um, by the way, we do acknowledge that Paul did ex use an expression in his writings where he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We understand that that means that when you die, you sleep and you're not aware of the passage of time. And just like that, the next thing you know, Jesus is in, in coming in the clouds, Right. So to be absent with, in the, from the body, the next thing you know, you're present with the Lord in a glorified body. We're going to read that here. This is 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 35. 
Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he says, but some will, someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another of flesh of beasts, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, talking about our mortal bodies, these bodies we have now. As we get older, we realize it's true. Before we completely pass away, we get to watch our bodies deteriorate. Isn't that wonderful? The older I get, the less I enjoy it. I'll be honest with you. But that's not anything. Nobody asked me about that. <laughs> Did they ask you? No. So Paul's talking about this. He says, uh, so it also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. When is it raised? At the moment you die? Let's read on. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Praise the Lord. Skipping ahead, let's go to verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, and he's talking about our mortal flesh, our fallen human nature bodies that we have now, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. When? Let's find out. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Have we heard the last trumpet yet? No. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? I'm on the last page. We're, we're getting there. Liars lie. Satan is cunning. What is he doing right now? We don't know everything he's doing. We're, it's not our job to try to outsmart him and figure out what he's doing. You know you're no match for him, right? I hear people say sometimes that Satan is stupid and he keeps doing dumb things. Well, in a sense that's true, but he's still smarter than we are. He knows the Bible better than we know it too. I'm afraid he's laying groundwork for what's about to burst upon this world. And these deceptions are part of his plan. We don't need to know his plan. We just need to know the truth and stay with the truth. No matter how appealing it is to get along with somebody when they tell you these things, it's not the truth. It can't ever be the truth. And I'm afraid that Satan is saving his best for last. And when I say best, I mean worst. You think you've seen deception so far? We call it the marvelous working of Satan. All these things are part of his plan. We don't want to be caught up in any of that, do we? We're no match for Satan, but you know who is? Jesus. Jesus met this tempter, this deceiver. He was in the wilderness, and suddenly he saw an angel. Did it look like a demon? No, it looked like an angel of light. But it didn't talk like an angel of light. And that's what Jesus realized right away. As soon as it opened its mouth and started talking, this isn't one of the good guys. And Jesus answered him, it is written. It is written. It is written. 
One of the it is written is from Deuteronomy. It says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Paul said, put on the armor of God. The whole armor of God includes the sword of the spirit, which is what? It's the word of God. I want to leave you on a more uplifting note. This is, this is not fun things to meditate on. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul again uh, is talking this time not to the Corinthians but to the Thessalonians. He's talking about a problem that they had in the church. It was, it was a matter of ignorance and it was nothing evil. It was just they, they didn't know. And that's what God had Paul there for. They were afraid that they didn't expect Jesus to linger that long. And some of the saints were falling asleep. They were passing away. And that's not what they thought. They thought everybody would stay alive and Jesus would come back. They thought, you know, it was imminent. So Paul writes to them in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting at verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Because they're in heaven right now. You know, he didn't, that's not how he comforts them, is it? Let's notice how he comforts them. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, I have that underlined in my Bible, even so. What does even so mean? It means in the same way. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Bring with him where? To heaven. Right? Even so, just as Jesus died and rose and went to heaven, even so, God is going to bring those who, who sleep in Jesus. You know, they should have thought and realized that there were people who died before Jesus even came along. What about Abel? He's been asleep for close to 6,000 years. What about him? Wouldn't he need to go too? And everybody in between? Verse 15, For this we say to you by word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, we're not going to heaven ahead of them. God is going to allow something to happen here. It's going to be wonderful for those of us who are alive to watch. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's when we're going to be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Not, not these words. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, what a wonderful thing it is to be your children. To have the wonderful promise of life eternal. Lord, we want it to unfold just how you want it to unfold. We want to be there on that day that the graves burst open. Whether we come out of the grave or whether we're alive at the time to see Jesus come. What a day it's going to be. What a wonderful thing it is to experience heaven. And yes, heaven is for real. And yes, there will be wonderful people there. I hope this family that we've read about or heard about their, the book. I hope they're there too. I hope each one in this room is there. Lord, please keep us. Keep us close to you. These are trying times. It's easy to lose faith. It's easy to lose our way. So much going on. Lord, we want to be among those who can't be deceived because we're among the elect. We can make our calling an election, sure, but we need your help. Dear Lord, give us your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 442. Let's stand.